The Cube at Hadoop Summit 2014 is brought to you by anchor sponsor Hortonworks. We do Hadoop. And headline sponsor, WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live at Hadoop Summit 2014. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. My co-host here is Jeff Kelly, the leading big data analyst in the industry. He's with wikibon.org. Jeff, uh, great show here. I'm excited to have our next guest, Abhi Mehta, CEO of Traceda, a uh, long time CUBE alumni. And I think we, you know, the CUBE has been following this event from day one. And it was in 2009, we coined data factories. Uh, data operating system. Data operating system, actionable insights. Industrial real revolution. Time, industrial revolution and transformation. And we're here now, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, always a pleasure. And you know, um, this is my highlight for any show, is sitting down with you and Jeff and, and talking, uh, you know, talking the future and, and, and I think clearing Clearly, finding the signal from the noise, as you said, but I'm going to borrow it for now, so. So I got to ask you, so we've been living this transformation vision we were talking about from day one, we saw it early, but as it played out, it's been interesting. You're seeing a couple things we had Rob Bearden on earlier about, talking about the massive size of the market. Jeff Kelly was the first analyst and firm to put out the first market sizing, 50 billion. That's just in Hadoop mm -hmm. that he quoted, but now you look at around that, the construction around the big data, it's in the hundreds and you know you can argue trillions of dollars in value. And you, we've talked about that. Correct. But look at what's played out, right? Um, Cloudera essentially had their IPO. They're now a whole other company doing <laughs> great. Um, they people cashed out, the, the employees, the founders, the VCs took money off the table. That's now off to the races of a big company. Hortonworks still a growing startup, kicking ass. And then you have Mapar doing well, you guys are doing well. Everyone's succeeding. Mm -hmm. So now we start talking about business outcomes. So where, where are we, Avi? Give us the straight scoop. What's going on in this market? I think, uh, so first of all, what I want to say is, it is refreshing to come back to Hadoop Summit. This is, I think, my seventh or eighth uh, uh, event. And my first event was 300 people, John, kind of just kind of level setting it. And apparently there are 3,200 people at the summit, and no pun intended, every single tech elephant we know is in this room right behind us. And I think it's a very refreshing, I would say refreshing in a, in a very positive light that the journey we started together in forecasting the future of data, right? Not the future of technology, but the future of data and how it empowers enterprises to redo what we've always said, business models is well underway. That, that journey is completely underway. The question always comes back to, where does the value sit? So you're absolutely right, we've had the initial uh, ring of companies monetize the value of the revolution for themselves, be it Cloudera, Hortonworks, and some others. I think we're seeing a culling of the initial ranks where the tool companies are, are either dying or no longer financially viable. And I think we're, starting, so we're seeing the starts of the early adopters in the enterprises, and you talk to them a lot, the practitioners, finding incredibly relevant and transformative business value by taking data not just from one source or two sources, from multiple sources, combining it into what we call a data asset, and solving problems that literally could not be solved before. And you're seeing that in every single industry. I think that's what makes it interesting for Truceda and your vision, is the fact that companies who deliver a capability, a set of software, what we call predictive analytics applications, that can help them redo their business model is where it sits. We came out and said with you that what's at stake isn't billions of dollars, it's trillions of dollars. And I think I read a report recently that said actually it's five trillion dollars. I think McKinsey wrote the report. What that means is we're not just redoing the database market. We're not redoing the BI market. We're not redoing the storage market. We are redoing the very fabric of what a bank, what a healthcare company, what a retailer looks like and how they solve problems and deliver solutions for their customers. So it's incredibly exciting. So we got some questions already on CrowdCheck. Go to crowdchat.net slash Hadoop Summit. It's pumping on all cylinders. You know, we've been following our progress. We're excited by that new engagement container we have. Nice. Uh, it's a great container. It really gets the data, active data. So uh, Bert asks you, what is, what is the biggest issue holding up production Hadoop implementations today? Great question. I think the biggest 
thing holding back the industry today in general is the lack of business applications. The two of you always ask me the question, and we've been asking this question of ourselves for three years now, that Abi, you know, you and me and Richard started a company three years ago to build business applications on Hadoop. And Jeff's telling me, he was on a panel today, and they asked, so where are the apps? And the only thing that comes up is Truseda. I think a lack of business applications that are helping companies get actionable insight, not fix security, not clean data. I'm actually disappointed that the biggest story at Hadoop Summit this year is data transformation. Mm -hmm. Data transformation is free. We give data cleaning, data curation, data parsing, software as part of our application bundle away for free. <laughs> and if we have to regress in our dialogue in the ecosystem around the hottest thing is data transformation, is this the wrong conversation to have? Because you cannot expect a business user to sit around and have a user-friendly tool to clean data. They expect clean data on, to before, get insight before from. Before we get to the dirty data, clean data <laughs> argument. So Mike Olson from Cloudera, the Cloudera CEO at the time said, this is the big data application, this is three years ago. Yes. It just never happened. So we, I asked Mike that question. He said, um, he said, analytics became the killer app. And the analytics was really what people focused in on. So analytics have come and gone. It's, it's mm -hmm. there now, it's native, you got visualization. What's next? So you guys are really the, one of the only ones out there with the app. So what will the apps look like? What does an app builder need to do? What is available? Is the, is the platform available? What, how do you see the app market getting, getting going? It's a fantastic question. As we have you know, ruminated over this particular question over three years, what we've realized is something one of our customers told us. So we asked them and said, what is it that we, that we did for you when you used our applications in the payments area that you could not have done before? And the answer was fascinating. The person took me back to the, uh, the uh, graduation of a economy, you know? How we used to be agrarian, then it became manufacturing, and then it became services, right? And he says the next generation of what technologies do is take manual business processes and automate it. So a great example would be fraud. Fraud is a fantastic example. Fraud today, in a particular scenario, actually let's be more specific, anti-money laundering, in a specific scenario, is a, is a monumental human challenge. Typically there'll be 4,000 people sitting in a middle office looking at <laughs> tickets around is this transaction a fraudulent transaction or not? What we have been able to do is a completely eliminate that manual business process. So I think the next frontier of an application is the automation of business processes where historically technology tools have made humans better. What we're doing now is actually taking to the next level. We are automating processes that things like deep learning, artificial intelligence, algorithms, machine learning can automate and then taking business processes that take thousands of people and putting it down to tens of people. That is what an application is. An automation of a business process that is solving a particular problem. Is the platform viable today to make that happen? Absolutely. I think it is a, we have to understand and realize, and this is my biggest, biggest problem with the industry and the ecosystem. Problem number one, two big problems, and I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> vent over here for a little bit because you gave me the chance. The cube is working, lie, um, lie down on the couch, we're happy to talk and, and make uh, things comfortable <laughs> for you. <Go> ahead. <laughs> But I think the first issue is we will do a disservice to the big data industry as participants in the ecosystem by making Hadoop a storage platform. Hadoop is not a storage platform. It was built to be a computational, a massively parallel computational engine, number one. Number two, let's not forget that there are companies, incredibly profitable next generation companies who have architected new business models on Hadoop. So let's take their names. Google, Facebook, Yahoo, and I think Yahoo's are back on an upswing. You know, even things like Microsoft, Twitter, LinkedIn, they have actually built brand new companies, business models, publicly traded companies mm -hmm. on Hadoop. So when someone says Hadoop isn't enterprise ready, are they telling me that Google with a $300 billion market cap isn't an <laughs> enterprise? Or LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook aren't enterprises? So I think it's the biggest or the worst kept secret to call Hadoop not enterprise ready. Hadoop came out. Six years ago, enterprise ready. And it's always been enterprise ready. Let me push back on that a little bit. So in those, those companies you mentioned kind of had a greenfield opportunity. They were built from scratch fairly, re fairly recently. Um, so how do you apply the technology in a way that's uh, as, as easily accessible to a company like 
P&G or Bank of America or some company that's been around for a long time, has a lot of legacy technology, and it's got to manage that, that it's a change management issue Nightmare. among other things. Absolutely. So, so how do you go about um, easing that transition? So I think I'll give you, I'll take an example of a, a very important customer of ours, a couple of customers actually. I think this is where the convergence of many trends are helping ease the pain. So let me first agree with you. I completely agree. The transition is painful, as they say, right? Rome wasn't built in a day. Mm -hmm. It took you know, weeks because you had to <laughs> deal with the legacy. Uh, I think it's a similar issue. So it's, while it is incredibly painful, there's a massive convergence of certain trends that is making it not just easier, but an eventuality that has to happen. The three big trends that we are witnessing, and you guys cover incredibly well, are cloud, big data, and mobile. And the convergence of those three trends are making this transition into you know, a application-focused business enterprise that is solving problems for their customers using data to make their lives better. At Trisera, we have this philosophy that if a customer of ours, an enterprise, uses our software, we want them to become customer advocates. We want them to make products and services that make the lives of their customers better. The fact that between cloud, big data, open source, mm -hmm. and mobile, the economics of the transition mm. is so much dramatically easier. So think of it, 10 years ago, when you had a transition from mainframe to client server, that was billions of dollars of transition. It doesn't, the economics for transitions are so much easier, mm -hmm. the pace of innovation so much more rapid, and the acceptance of open source as an enterprise ready technology platform in general, mm -hmm. so much more cleaner, that the, the pain behind the transition is a lot less. Mm -hmm. It will take time. What we're seeing happen is the creation of new organizations in enterprises, when they're all called these chief data officer organizations, that are helping highlight areas where the transition could be better. So we call it, you know, uh, get, a, get a one quick win. Get one win to fund future wins. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing the start of companies picking business areas or, pro or problem challenges or business opportunities to find the early win on and then transition platforms. Surprisingly enough, Jeff, what's helping them is a traditional licensing model. The fact that software used to be sold in a perpetual license model, and if you stop paying the, the maintenance fees, you still own the software. What they're saying is, I can stop paying for my legacy software, mm -hmm. keep it running, not grow it, and then start offloading, not storage, but analytical workloads mm -hmm. onto new technologies. And in a very ironic way, the perpetual licensing model, transition to a term licensing model, is helping ease the transition. Yeah. Well, yeah, expand It'll take time. Expand on that a little bit. We were talking a little bit beforehand about how the, the sales motion has changed significantly in the software industry. Correct. So tell us a little bit about what, how, how you see that uh, evolving and how that the, has evolved. I think the, the market is, is the best teacher, as we all say. And when we started to say that, we made a big bet. We said, what will differentiate us is not going to be only technology, is not going to be only domain, and it's not going to be only science. It'll be a combination of the three. You've heard me talk about it in the past. Mm -hmm. I think what we haven't spoken a lot about, and we're seeing happen, is a complete disintermediation of the existing technology sales cycle, where the back slapping and things <laughs> that we don't need to say on air, uh, sales activities that go on to sell technology, just don't work anymore. What we are finding and realizing is the person, for example, at, at Reseda, who runs our financial services vertical, is a banker at heart and a technologist by training. So the ability to understand which combinations of technology algorithms in a particular business area can help deliver actionable insight and communicate that, not just to a technology buyer, mm -hmm. not just to a business buyer, not just to a chief data officer, but a combination of the three, is a very different skill. Here's the good news, it can work. What we have proven at Trusela now is, if you can actually bring it together, even in an open source ecosystem, the value to be delivered to us as a software company is multi seven figures. So if you can communicate the vision, if you can build the software and implement in delivering actionable insight, in that tripartite sales conversation mm -hmm. that has never existed before, mm -hmm with a different kind of salesperson, it can absolutely be done. But it's a big change. I'm surprised why there's not much being written. As much as you write about the stack being turned over, mm -hmm. technology changing, economics changing, 
not many people are writing about the fact the sales model is fundamentally different. That's why large tech is struggling. They can't sell anymore. They're knocking on the door, no one answers the knock. So I got I to talk to you, you know, you know We've always talked about our crowd chat, all the stuff we're doing, data science, the work you're doing, we're pioneering a lot of the big data. Um, so I think there's some use cases out there where people have taken like the platform from say Hortonworks or using social data like what we're doing. True Car was on yesterday mm -hmm. showing some real innovation around having a clean sheet of paper. So I got to ask you, because you've been on both sides of the house, you've seen the legacy side at banks, the existing legacy, and you've got a clean sheet of paper with Traceda. Describe the, the differences, the two roads, and, and how does someone work in a, in, a, in a green field or a clean sheet of paper, new venture, and how does someone work in a legacy to bring the new world into, an, uh, into a legacy world? What are the challenges, what's the opportunity? I think the biggest, it's a phenomenal question. I think the biggest challenge, let's go to the legacy part first, John. The biggest challenge is finding a nugget and a team and someone with balls to take some risk. <laughs> take some, and I'm, I'm very serious about yeah. this, take some risk. Bold on, moves. Take, make some bold moves yep. that give you early wins. That's the biggest uh, issue around legacy infrastructures not being quick enough for disruption. Because as, as, as is very well said, disruption happens. Whether you want it to happen or not, disruption happens. So I think the biggest lesson we have learned is it takes one person with a dream gene in a large legacy organization to say, I'm going to make a bet against one particular problem to prove that a new way of thinking, of doing things, can actually deliver value. If you can find the person with the dream gene and make sure the person is successful, it will work. On the green field of paper, I actually think starting a company in the current times is trickier than working in a big company taking my call. Because when you take our call, we make your life easier. If you're a junior officer at a large bank or a retailer, you've basically made your life easier by having solved what we call is the collect data, curate the data, compute the insight, convert the insight. We've already done that. I have been incredibly humbled as an entrepreneur in trying to figure out what are the right bets to make. As fast and fluid as the open source community is, it's also very tricky when you know, tides change very quickly. Mm -hmm. Companies you think are not going to make it announce large rounds of funding and, and things change. I think making the right bets in open source given the fact that open source will lead the world, not just software will lead the world, my twist, open source will lead the world, has been an incredibly hard, incredibly hard experience with great reward because I think we made some good bets and we figured out how to play in that, in that domain. What's the biggest challenge you've had for being an entrepreneur, you being nice <laughs> about it, there are some rough days, you grind, it's a meat grinder. Yes. Because you know, you, if you fail, you could go out of business. Yes. The big company, you, you get the posh funding. But as a startup, you got to make tough calls. What has been the hardest challenge for you um, as an entrepreneur, and how did you react to that adversity? Share a story. I think uh, it's a, uh, no, there, there are tons of them. I remember talking to Christian Chabot in the first year of Tuseda and saying, Christian, why is it that I feel one day that I rule the world? And I had that, uh, that Titanic <laughs> moment. I want to stand on a ship and say, you know, I'm the king of the world. And the other day I think I can't make payroll. And he says, he laughed. <laughs> and he said, Abi, for the first year of Tableau, and we all know Tableau, we all love Tableau. I remember talking about Tableau in 2009 on the Cube, yeah, and yeah. you and Dave saying, Which, what company is this, you know? And, and now we all know who Tableau is. And he says, Pat Hanran and him, throughout the first year, were sitting in the parking lot and have the same conversation. Are we going to make it? The trickiest conversations for me have been the people, have the people conversations. Um, you know, finding the right talent and and having them buy into the passion and the vision as much as we believe it. Surprisingly enough, the customer part has been easy. The customers we've gone to, we had our first customer in our first year. We are cash flow positive as a company in two years of operations, you know. We, you know, we have doubled our capital. We have tripled our company. So you look at the customer part being easy, but finding and hiring talent that can sit with you and, you know, I have a saying to say that when, when we sit down and talk about, they'll say, Abhi, it's your company. I say, no, it's our company. Finding people with the same passion to make a dent in the world, to change the world. We fundamentally believe at Trusera, John, that we are rewriting the book on enterprise software. That the way enterprise software will be written, delivered, and sold is being done successfully at Trusera today. And you and I will sit here five years from now and say, Abhi, what did you do? And I'll say, I have no idea. 
<laughs> but we had a we had a very strong vision. So is it DevOps focused? Is it more SaaS? What's the, what is no, the I new think enterprise? No, I think it's 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 having a very clear vision. I think we are one of few companies in the three years you've known us, we haven't pivoted. You've never seen me use anything except the original vision and idea. We have stayed so focused on the original vision in spite of all the diversions, yeah. and I you know it. And I got to say, you, you and Rob Bearden have been absolutely clear every time in theCUBE, there's been no body swerving, it's the same vision, you're executing your original idea, and, that's been and, the you're, and you're doing well. And that's been the hardest, because when you are not doing well, and you are being quoted to raise money, and you have smart people telling you, but that's not, it's not, this hasn't worked before. I think the challenge I've had is, not many people in the money giving community, and the money making community, aka the clients, truly understand what enterprise software in the future will look like. No one has a clue. They, they want to recreate databases and tools and BI and Hadoop, all that is commodity. Mm. When you don't have a clue, it becomes very tricky on which people you listen to or not. <laughs> and that I would say has probably been the hardest, John, is staying focused on the vision when the future is unclear. But I think that's what, as Ben Horowitz, Horowitz would say, that is the hard thing about hard things. And it's been, it's been a phenomenal, we are proud that I can still sit over here with the two of you, have the ability to sponsor Silicon Angle, which has been always, as I said, the first thing we will ever, ever write a check to <laughs> is you guys, and sit and have a conversation on the success we've had, because it's been hard days. You know, we get a lot of feedback. People say we should, we should like do more selling out, and we want to, don't want, we want sponsorships, we want to get the right people. You've been a great supporter, and you know what? We believe in transparency, and that's why the Cube exists. We want to make it accessible for everybody, and uh, we could make more money, but we don't because it changes the game. So, so we've lived that with you. Absolutely. And what I find challenging is staring down people who have potentially what look, might look like a better deal. <laughs> oh, take the money over here. What you're saying is you had to make those choices. Mm -hmm. The conventional wisdom was, that's never worked before. But I got a bag of money coming this way and I'll fund it because we are funding that sector. Correct. You say, no, that's not the vision we have. How hard is that? Do you, Very. I mean, have in, you, like, do you waffle 50-50 and then say no? You John, say, in, incredibly. I think I'll tell you what is harder. Uh, I'm surprised as an entrepreneur as how many, why there is such a big focus in the Valley and the larger startup community on how much money you raise versus how much money you make. Trisada, in essence, had a Series A round with our customers, you guys reported our numbers. We did a re year last year where we signed $10 million worth of business. That was our Series A. We didn't give any equity up, we didn't dilute any shareholders, but we, in essence, have spent that much money in building Trisada. It is incredibly hard, not just to say no to bags of money who want to invest in you, but take them in, your, in their direction. You can't imagine how many people have come to and said, well, maybe you should build a database company, maybe you should build a BI company, you should do more visualization. And we're like, no, no, and no. But it's harder with the customers. When customers come to you with a bag of cash and say, well, what I really need is this vision. And that is, I think, our test, is yeah. saying no and saying no. Product, that market, is not product market fit, when customers are paying for your product, is absolutely value, and I will say this on the record, and this is my maybe old school view, the how much money you raise is not the benchmark for entrepreneurial success. A lot of the young kids think, oh, I raised a big VC round, I've made it. What they don't know is that's the start line and you've got dynamics that you've inherited for the money Correct. that you may or may not even need. So Correct. the true entrepreneur are the ones who can maintain control of the company and do no financing. <laughs> but if you do a venture round, maintain control. Absolutely. Because you can be creative, you can control the culture, the founders can stay around or leave, yes. but you're not going to get booted. So the fear is, that's the fear. But like, you know, I just say, vote with your wallet. If you can scale a company, self-funded with customer cash flow, it's equity-free capital. Absolutely. So, it's, it's, I say, I tell, every, I tell every entrepreneur, revenue is the cheapest form of capital. And I think that's, <laughs> but that's my point. I think big data, let's go back to you know, the big data subject, John and Jeff. Big data with the open source underpinnings finally provides every entrepreneur the opportunity to get to cash quickly. I am incredibly surprised why we are funding big data startups. Leave aside the infrastructure distribution comp uh, mm -hmm. uh, companies. Other analytical companies don't need hundreds of millions of dollars to build predictive analytics applications. Because if you are truly building predictive analytics applications, 
your average deal size is multi-million dollars. Mm -hmm. You don't need $20 million to build a company, you don't. Here's my, here's my thing, I'm going to say this again, being bold, being, since we're being bold, I'll, I'll <laughs> vent a little bit. If you're an entrepreneur and you can't build a product and generate sales, you're not worthy to start a company. Agreed. If you are in the SaaS, cloud, open source world, your tools and paint brushes free. are free. Yes. And if you can't paint like, at least a minor Picasso, or a small piece of art and can't get anything for it, don't even start a company. Go work for the big company. Completely because agree. What, why is everyone engineering their time to get VC funding? Show some traction. Absolutely. Show some sales, show some mojo. That to me is the test. Now, if it you're is. building a fab plant, or a, story. or a clean yeah. tech venture, or, yeah, or a car farm company. tech, Absolutely. no problem. Absolutely. Yeah, do the prototype, raise a boatload of money, but get a partner. I think it's partner. what you said, I think it's been very hard. But I will say it's also reassuring because it has given us the luxury as three, three industry participants to talk about what do big data technology software companies look like in the future. And I would love to you know, sit down with you, Jeff, and talk about the architecture of the company, mm. not just our software, right? Because we have our salespeople, our domain experts, and they're talking to CMOs and CROs, and you know, we should run you through what our sales cycles look like mm -hmm. and how they've shrunk from six months to six weeks, and how we build, test, deploy our software incredibly rapidly. And I think in that is the nuggets of what do those companies in the future look mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to be able to speak the, the language of business, not just the language of technology. If you're selling to an end user, essentially, a C-level executive who wants to get a problem solved, they don't want to hear about MapReduce and Scoop Absolutely. And, and all that stuff. So you've got to be able to speak to them on a level that makes that resonates with them, and that's about solving a problem that's going to either save them money or make them money. It's pretty simple. Absolutely. And, and move their business forward. If Correct. you can do that, and your product can deliver, then you've got something. Exactly. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, I, I would love to get your take. It sounds like, and, and, and you've mentioned, some of, the, some of the tools companies are kind of starting to go poof. Um, they will go, if they haven't gone poof, was, they're going to go poof. Well, so my question is, do you feel like, and, and related to what John's point about, you know, raising all this money, especially in the big data space, is pretty easy. It's just, yeah, I've got a big data company, okay, here's, here's $10 million. Um, do you think people are getting into this for the wrong reasons? They're getting into this to create, a, all right, I've got a decent technology, I'm going to raise a bunch of money and I'm going to sell it to one of these big whales out here who are, who are desperate, clutching at straws to somehow get their own big data strategy, which they, some of them, frankly, don't understand I think the it's market a, at all. Is that happening, or, or what's, what's the dynamic? You know, you, you probably know it better than I do, but I'll give you my perspective on Truseda. Sure. We're building Truseda for the long term. Whether that's an IPO, I have, since day one, we have never thought that Truseda's takeout is another company. Or let's make Truseda attractive, that someone else will look at it and go, oh, well, you have, so you hit the metrics. You have X number of salespeople, mm -hmm. you have Y developers, you and Z markets. I don't care you're losing money. You, you fit the box right. for us to come acquire you, right? We have never built it that way. Mm -hmm. I think you raise a very interesting point though, which is what are people priming the company for? Yeah. And I think the answer, in our opinion, is it's the, why people don't understand that tools and infrastructure will get commoditized baffles me. What it tells me is there are certain books written around how you build technology companies around a particular stack-like concept that have not, that need to be rewritten, but no yeah. one's rewritten, re rewritten it yet. They're out of date. They're out of date. Mm -hmm. No one knows what the future actually looks like. They're all trying to approximate it, mm -hmm. and that's where I think our bet is the most interesting. So I fundamentally do believe that if you are building a, building a tool company, it will not work. If you're not building something around predictive analytics on a stack that fundamentally is open source, it will not work. If you cannot add, and I think that you, you mentioned those words, talk to a business user, deliver for a business user, I think the most important part over there is, everybody is skeptical. <laughs> everybody is skeptical that you can take business processes and you can automate the last mile in technology. Because historically, it could not have been automated at scale and, in, mm -hmm. and with the right economics. Mm -hmm. But it can be now. Mm. What does that look like? Nobody knows. Mm. I think that's the white space we want to play in. The, you know, the, the little gray areas, or the nooks and cranny, where people want to hide, it doesn't interest us. So <laughs> BI, visualization, dashboarding, transformations, cleaning, curation, good luck, you know, we wish you the best. We give away for free. So if anybody, any company wants to get a data transformation toolkit, mm -hmm. we give it for free, don't buy it. Mm. Well, it was, I think you know, it's 
important for people to understand. You're not saying those things aren't important. They're what very important. They're critically important. But they're what critically you're saying, important. But, it's, but that's not where how you, in, in, the, in, the, in this new world, that's not how you're going to deliver value and build a company. Not, not, absolutely, not, not to mention in the collect data, curate the data, aka process transform it, compute the insight and convert the insight, you can't piecemeal that process. Every analytical application really, really good has to do all those four activities within the application. So you can't say, I'm building a, a company to collect data. I'm building a company to just curate the data. It doesn't work that way. People, logical human beings don't think that way. <laughs> Business processes don't work that way. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly hard to take that, that logical cycle of taking raw data and monetizing insight mm -hmm. and doing it piecemeal with multiple vendors, it doesn't work. Right, well, which is, which, you know, which applies to what's going on here in the Hadoop ecosystem, because it's very much, you take a company like Hortonworks, they're very much partner-centric. Absolutely. And, you know, bringing on all the different components from different vendors, and, you know, which is why, you know, we're seeing so many partnerships that are, you know, really investing in kind of um, engineering partnerships, really, get, really working together on the ground to get them to work together, because as you say, it's got to be, as seamless as possible. So that's one of the challenges in, in a market like this, I think. It is, it is, but I think those partnerships, you know, are a, a very short-term focused thing. We have said before, I, I'm very mortal in my comments, but ETL is dead, we won't say that, but ETL <laughs> is free. Mm -hmm. ETL is free, it's free, it's free, We need it's more free. time on the queue, we got to get to the dirty data conversation. <laughs> uh, ETL is free, BI is free, you know, mm -hmm. um, data transformation is free, metadata is free, there's edge catalog, you know, there's driven by cascading. Those Basic database oriented functions are functions you can't build companies around. They are commodities forever. So give it up and let's go to the next level where you can, where you can bring it all together seamlessly. Mm -hmm. You can't keep moving data. I mean, this is like repeating our conversation from, nine, from four years ago. You can't move data back and forth. It ha one, Hadoop is a storage, processing, analysis, and visualization platform all in one. Why we don't say it more often why we don't imbibe that as a business model? Well, you know, I, I guess gotta, we do. I, I got to ask you, while we got running out of time here, are the folks that are attending the conferences, you got the three buckets, so the minnows, the tunas, and the whales. <laughs> the minnows are the startups to ser through Series B funding, and then everyone from Series C funding to pre-IPO, the, the tunas, and then IPO, big companies, the whales. Yes. Who wins and who loses in those categories? In each bucket, what do the people have to do to succeed, and if they don't do that, they'll lose. In, so startups, growing companies, and public. In each category, what are the pitfalls, what are the critical traps, and what do people need to do to be successful in each So theater? I think I'll, this will be the, I guess, the, quick, the shortest answer I've ever given you, John, <laughs> which is, give me a pack of perhanas versus a whale, Guess what, I'll, I'll always pick a pack of piranhas. <laughs> Just scale out commodity hardware, a bunch of piranhas. I, I will always pick, because a slow moving whale in front of a pack of piranhas, it only ends one way, you know? And there's blood in the water, but it only ends one way. Yeah, this yeah. is not complimentary. Hats off to your re most recent research that I'm dying to read yeah. around the, the points that this is a replacement for the technology stack. It's not a yeah. complementary stack. It's well, I said that early on, Jeff slapped me down a little bit, so the numbers weren't that high in the adoption on that number, but uh -huh. it's very clear that the trend line is clearly going towards a replacement. Absolutely, and clearly. I think people don't want to talk about it right now because it's one of those things where it's you know, someone's on life support, they're like, hey, no, he's going to make it, come on, it's going to happen, yeah. we're going to cheer yeah. for it, the but no, yeah. come on. We our see a, a cliff coming. Absolutely. Yeah, our numbers are clearly trending that way. I, the reason I corrected <laughs> you is because it it's not showing that definitively yet. And frankly, yeah. there's a lot of... No, I know, I was over the top. Right, I, there's, I apologize. There's a lot of, um, look, there's, there's a huge industry and a lot of the players are behind us who are, yes. uh, have a very vested interest in, in making that argument. Absolutely. Um, and that messaging is getting through to customers. Look, I think I'll only say one thing. If you follow stock prices, which I'm sure everybody does, there's a reason why large tech is, yeah. is on, the, on a spiral. It's not because open source is killing it. It is fundamentally because the sales process, how technology is built, delivered, and sold, all three, mm -hmm. is completely different. If you want to see that, what that looks like, you know, that's what we, I truly believe, and if we have a humble start at Prasada to prove that next-gen model. I think we're doing a phenomenal job executing and what that future looks like. Great to see you, hear you on theCUBE. I mean, we could go for another hour, but I want to get your, your lab. I want you to share with the folks out there, because uh, we, we've been talking about this from day one, and yes. you've been pretty much right on all your predictions, um, and you're in the trenches building a company. What is the big takeaway from this year, from your perspective? 
looking at the landscape and the movement of the, of the players here. Over the past year to this year, what's happened and what will happen in the next short term, near term, say next six to eight months? I think two major trends, uh, John. One is, uh, I get asked the question a lot, given the fact that we have grown up on the East Coast and have a financial background, uh, are we in a bubble? And you know, Mark and Andreessen has spoken about it. Um, I think you will see a coming to earth of valuations. I was looking at numbers yesterday, and you know, Splunk's at a sub four billion market cap, Tableau is at a sub four billion market cap, and Clarera got valued at 4.2 billion in the private markets. So I think you will see a much smarter movement of money towards disruptors that will get valued very aggressively, but reasonably. There's, there's something for us to, there's a canary in the coal mine when IPOs of Box and Square stall, and we should all be very cognizant of it. Uh, as my lawyer uh, in the West Coast reminds me, the last time there was a bubble, there were two things that defined it in Silicon Valley. Traffic on 101 and real estate prices. I hear both those things are headed in the wrong direction again. So I think that's something to watch out for. I think from an adoption cycle, we will see a dramatic increase in reduction of IT budgets with large corporates being replaced with much more scalable economical technologies. So I think fundamentally, the top lines of large tech players are under massive attack. And you will see that transform rather quickly into larger contracts and deals for companies like ours, but on a magnitude, it's going to be you know, multitudes lower than what we have been used to seeing in large tech. I think those are both two defining trends. You will see the pack of piranhas move very quickly. The piranhas are there and they're dangerous in the, in the herd and that's big data, it's all about the, the data everywhere. Thanks for coming on, congratulations well, on your you. success. Uh, you're a tech athlete, you know, self-funded, customer uh, funded, you're, you're very kind. great value proposition. Um, an example, I'm going to look back 10 years. Remember when, <laughs> you know, 10 years, a no, 10 year cycle, so. John, I have to say something. It's um, the, the vision, the support, and what the two of you and SiliconANGLE, Vicky Bond, the Cube do for entrepreneurs is invaluable. The voices you have made heard of someone like myself, when three years ago we announced to sit on the Cube, it is what you are doing for the entrepreneurial community is invaluable to make the Pirhana swifter. So thank you for that, yeah, yeah. and thanks to our customers. We would not be, we wouldn't have this confidence were it not for our customers agreeing with us in our vision. So thank you for everything the Cube does for entrepreneurs. I got a tear in my eye because it's, <laughs> it means a lot to me to hear you say that. It's truly what we strive for, extract the signal noise, and it's about transparency. You know, we, we get blocked a lot, believe me. You know, O'Reilly sure do. Media doesn't want us that Hadoop world, that's clear. Yeah. Um, but you know what, we will do whatever it takes to make, get the word out. We got crowd chat now engaged out there. Open source content is about enabling people to collaborate, and that's always been an amazing business model, creates massive change, you're a part of it. Glad to have you support as, us, thank as, you so as, much. As Ron Burgundy said, 24 hour sports <laughs> was a bad idea, you know? Uh, they look back at 24 hour of tech TV and, and say the same thing. <laughs> hey, we, we could be a VC firm someday. Here, all these <laughs> bloggers are moving into becoming venture capitalists yes, these days. Yes, you they know, are, yes Get a blog job, be in the Cube, next thing you know, you're a CEO <laughs> or a venture capitalist. This is the Cube, we'll be right back from Hadoop Summit. Exciting, exciting activity here. We'll be right back after the short break. <laughs>